Amen. I'd like to read a couple of verses from 1 John, chapter 4, verse 7 to verse 11. Page 1084, if you have the Red Bibles. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Praise the Lord. Does God love us? Does God love us unconditionally? Well... Last week, uh, if you watched the royal marriage, you may have heard Bishop Michael Curry speaking, had the opportunity to speak to two billion people, which is, uh, I guess, every preacher's dream. <laughs> Not something I'm likely to experience myself, but um, he spoke with passion, spoke a very passionate uh, piece of oratory, spoke about the power of love and of hope, delivered a message with fire and passion. And he did bring Jesus into it. He said that Jesus died to save us all, which is good so far. And I think that uh, many people even... My wife actually had Twitter on, and there were some people who were complaining that uh, he's bringing Jesus into it, uh, which is, uh, you know, not the sort of thing you should do in the church, is it? But, anyway. but uh, many people found his message really inspiring and what people want to hear. Two young people fall in love, and it releases the power of love, which can change the world was a good message of what I call liberal Protestantism. Um, quite a lot of the church is pre preaching this message, and I want to kind of deconstruct it a bit today and put some views which obviously Michael Curry would not have been able to put at a wedding because it wouldn't really be appropriate to do that. And he didn't have enough time to do it anyway. But what he missed out is what much of the church today is missing out, and what the, what the liberal church, I would say, is missing out altogether. Um, he did say that Jesus died to save us all, but he didn't give any idea what this means and how his death does save us. Uh, there's a man called Gavin Ashenden who uh, comments on the Church of England, and uh, I actually happen to agree with most of the things he says on his blog, and he said, the world is rightly talking about Bishop Michael Curry's wedding sermon. It was a tour de force. He is very good at preaching. It also offers us all an insight into the dramatic difference between two kinds of Christianity that are at odds with each other. We call them for the moment Christianity Max and Christianity Light. Credit where it's due, Christianity Light can be very appealing, reaches out to where people are hurting, encourages them, reaches out to where they're longing for good change, and it promises them, promises them that change can come. Speaks continuously of love and hope. Everyone likes to hear of love and hope. But it has three serious flaws. It doesn't define love, and it never delivers on the hope, and it isn't what Jesus preached. So, what did he preach? Well, first thing he said was that God is love. Where true love is, God, where true love is found, God himself is there. Quote what he said, There's power in love, do not underestimate it. Anyone who's ever fallen in love knows what I mean. But think about love in any form or experience of it. It actually feels good to be loved and to express love. There's something right about it, and there's a reason. An old medieval poem says it, Where true love is found, God himself is there. Bible 1 John 4 says it in this way, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God. Whoever does not love, it does not know God, for God is love. There's power in love. Love can help and heal where nothing else can. Love can lift up and liberate for living when nothing else will. And on to say that God loves us all unconditionally. It says, But the love of which we speak is not only for couples getting married or just for interpersonal relationships, Jesus of Nazareth taught us that the way of love is the way to a real relationship with the God who created us, all of us, and the way to a true relationship with each other as children of that one God, as brothers and sisters in God's human family. One scholar said it this way, Jesus has founded the most revolutionary movement in human history, a movement built on the unconditional love of God for the world and the mandate to live that love. Charles Marsh's The Beloved Community. Jesus died on the cross as an example of love. 
Just tell the love of Jesus how he died to save us all. He didn't sacrifice his love for himself or anything he could get out of it. He did it for others, for the other, for the good and well-being of others. That's love. And he went on to conclude that God wants us to love as Jesus loved. If we do this, we can save the world and we can abolish injustice, poverty, or etc. Quote again from Bishop Michael, he says, How does St. Paul say it? Love is not jealous, rude or boastful. Love does not insist in its own way. Love is unselfish, sacrificial, kind and just. Love seeks the good and well-being of the other. Love makes room and space for the other to be. See 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. This love, this is the way of Jesus, and it's a game changer. Imagine our families, our homes, when this way of love is the way. Imagine our neighborhoods and communities when love is the way. Imagine our governments and countries when love is the way. Imagine business and commerce when this love is the way. Imagine our world when love is the way. No child would go to bed hungry such, in such a world as that. Poverty would become history in such a world as that. The earth would be a sanctuary in such a world as that. We treat one another as children of God, regardless of differences. We learn how to lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside to study war no more. There will be a new heaven, a new earth, a new world, a new and beautiful human family, the very dream of God. Okay, sounds good, doesn't it? The three issues I want to talk about. First, about God is love. Secondly, God loves us all unconditionally. And third, God wants us to love as Jesus loves if we do that. We can save the world. So what's the problem? God is love. Surely that's true. It's, scripture says that. The very nature of God is love, and he loves us as people. It says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Bishop Michael went on to say that this is shown in the love between a young couple getting married. There is a little bit of a problem coming in already. He's equating the love between a man and a woman that brings them together in marriage with the same thing as the love of God. If you want to be technical, it's eros and agape. They're not totally the same. Agape is the unchanging love of God which doesn't change. It's hope that as a man and woman come together in marriage, it's not just eros, but it's also agape. There is a commitment on the part of both parties to love each other, to stay faithful to each other. And we know that this is part of God's plan in creation. In fact, the earliest institution which God puts into being in the Bible is marriage of a man between a, a man and a woman. Where we read that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined in one flesh, they sh joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's God's will. Uh, God's will that so they should come together for mutual companionship, for sexual union, procreation, and the care of children. And that there should be a commitment uh, one to another until death us do part. That is actually a commitment which has its part in the agape love of God. But in our fallen world, we have to recognize that the love between a man and a woman is not actually a guaranteed constant. Uh, people can fall in love and fall out of love. The love of God in agape is a guaranteed constant. It's an unchanging thing. And I said people can fall in love and they can fall out of love. They can make a commitment one day to be faithful to each other, to a death as to part, but the next day they can commit adultery, they can fall out of love, they can divorce, and they can be unfaithful. That's not God's will. What God brought together, brought together not to be separated, but it happens. And in fact, in the case of Harry and Meghan, it's already happened, because Meghan has been married and been divorced and is now being married again, which raises another question, which uh, causes some difficulties. Harry's actually had plenty of lovers before Meghan as well. We hope and pray that they will live together in harmony for the rest of their lives, but it's not in itself agape love. It's not the power to change the world, as Bishop Michael was talking about. Okay, let's go back to 1 John. He says, in John, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. There's a power in love. What about the nature of the love of God? If we go to 1 John 4, the following verses actually tell us something which is very important, which is kind of the conditional part of God's love. And we do need to understand the significance of this. Because, in fact, what Bishop Michael was saying is very much what the Protestant liberal church is saying today, which is actually creeping into much of evangelicalism and 
By missing out what he missed out, it missed missing out what much of contemporary evangelicalism is also missing out. Missing out something very fundamental about the gospel. And it ends up with a kind of diversity agenda which fits in very well with the diversity agenda of our society today, which is, that God, which is that we should include everybody in the family of God, no matter how they live, no matter where they come from, and that we are all brothers and sisters simply by being born as humans. Uh, we're not brothers and sisters by being born again into the family of God. Uh, it fits actually into what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, which is one of the signs of the last days when he said that people have the form of godliness but denying its power. Uh, what is the power which Paul is talking about? Is it the power to speak a fine sermon with a lot of oratory? Uh, is it the power to zap people on the stage and have them fall down under the power of the Holy Spirit? It's not actually. If you go to Romans chapter 1, he tells us exactly what the power is, the power which is available in the gospel. Romans 1.16, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and for the, also for the Greek. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The power is actually in the gospel, which <coughs> gives the power of salvation to those who believe. Now, by implication, it does not give the power of salvation to those who do not believe. Is that okay? The power of the gospel actually changes our destiny from hell to heaven. It brings us from being under the wrath of God to experiencing the mercy and the forgiveness of God and the grace to eternal life. Today we actually have a new gospel which is creeping in, which is non-judgmental, which says that actually everybody is accepted by God and we must accept everybody else. It's what I call the diversity agenda. I would say the diversity agenda is actually the religion of Great Britain today. And if you go against it, you're actually going against the flow and you'll find yourself almost treated as a heresy. Uh, the implication of is it we're all children of God as a result of being born, therefore we're brothers and sisters in God's family. God accepts everybody. We're loved as we are, therefore we must accept everybody as brothers and sisters in God, regardless of their race. Yes, because whatever race you're born into is the race you're born into, and God accepts all people, regardless of whether they're black or white or whatever race they come from. We're all one in Christ Jesus. But we must also accept people on the basis of whoever they are, wherever they come from, whatever their religious affiliation, whatever their faith, and whatever their behavior is. And we have to say no to that, as far as God is concerned. We can accept people as people and love them, but we don't accept them as brothers and sisters in the faith. And that's a big difference. If you know anything about Bishop Curry, you know that he is right on for the diversity agenda, as is Meghan Markle and I think Carrie as well. And in fact, Meghan is being celebrated by the media as in the right on establishment because he is, she is a representative, if you like, of the diversity agenda coming into the royal family and hopefully changing the royal family into what they want it to be, uh, pushing for the diversity agenda. Meghan said she's 100% for feminism. She made it clear she intends to take the royal family in a new direction, declaring she's proud to be a woman and a feminist speaking of her lifelong commitment to women's empowerment. Well, I won't say what you think about her feminism, but that's part of her agenda. She's also for the homosexual lifestyle. As Prince Harry was appointed Commonwealth Youth Ambassador by the Queen, Meghan and Harry have promised to put gay rights at the forefront of their agenda. At a youth conference in London, as part of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, Megan said that LGBT issues were about basic human rights, stressed the importance of challenging inequality based on sexual orientation and gender identity. That means challenging those who say there's something wrong with homosexual practice and people changing their gender if they feel that they're women when they're born a man or um, they're men when they're born a woman. Um, Bishop Curry, who spoke at the wedding, is also an enthusiast for gay rights. His message that love is the way involves affirming the rights of homosexuals to marry in church and transge transgender rights. 
His Facebook page shows him giving a homosexual kiss to a man called Louis Carr. Clay, who is described as being a queer poet and religious activist throughout the Anglican Communion. He's also against fundamentalist Christians who say that such things are, are sinful. Uh, Megan's also an enthusiast for yoga. She says, I love an intense yoga class. Uh, even better if I do it in a dark room with candlelight. I do yoga a couple of times a week, hot yoga specifically. She agreed to get baptized in the Church of England before the wedding out of respect for Harry's grandmother, the Queen, rather than any expression of faith herself in the Lord Jesus Christ and the willingness to obey his commandments. In fact, the C of E prayer book for adult baptism has the words, I turn to Christ, I repent of my sins, I renounce evil. Did you do that? Uh, as far as the Bible is concerned, sex outside of marriage is sinful. Homosexual practice is sinful. Yoga is not going to lead you to God, it's going to lead you away from God. In fact, yoga is very much the in thing today, especially among the trendy right on set. And many people, including those within the church, think yoga is fine and that Christians can do yoga, and it's compatible with the gospel. Uh, in fact, yoga is in conflict with biblical Christianity. Yoga is based on a Hindu philosophy of discovering the God within you through meditation, doing yoga poses. There's a yoga teacher called Maharishi Yogi who said, man is divine, the inner man is fully divine, be still and know that you are God. When you know you're God, you begin to live Godhood. Is that true? Do you find God within yourself? Swami Muktananda said, kneel to your own self, honor and worship your own being. God dwells within you as you. Discover the God within you. That's again part of the philosophy of the world today. You discover God within yourself. You are God. You're potentially gods. Uh, who said you should be as God? <laughs> yeah. Actually, you don't discover God within yourself. Paul says, I know that within me, that is in my flesh, draws no good thing. You don't discover God within yourself, though actually God, Satan, may give counterfeit experiences of light and peace, which convince people that they have encountered God. We can actually only come to know God by being born again of the Holy Spirit as we repent of our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who came from heaven to earth in order to save us, give us eternal life. He comes from outside of our life into our life. We don't discover him inside of our lives in our natural condition. He said, actually, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So he's outside of our life. We have to open the door into our lives through faith in Jesus. So authentic Christianity and yoga don't mix. They're opposed to each other. I would suggest also that pushing for homosexual rights... I'm not saying that homosexuals should be put in prison or hate it, but pushing for homosexual marriage and pushing for the homosexual agenda is actually going to end up opposing the Christian message. And it's already doing so. Uh, often, actually, the, any expression of biblical Christianity and moral teaching on this subject is being suppressed in public. And if you speak out in this way, you may be uh, accused of being unloving. In fact, in the name of diversity, you must be loving and accepting of practicing homosexuals and allow them to get married. You must accept transsexuals, as the C of E guidelines now say you must. In fact, the C of E has just said that uh, they should have a special service for transsexuals who want to change their, their sexuality, and that they're affirming something which is uh, right and which is a statement of their, their, their status before God. Actually, they're affirming their rebellion against God if they do that. You've got to accept everyone, but not anyone who says these things are wrong. But increasingly in our society, if you speak against any kind of sexual practices forbidden in the Bible, or religious practices which are wrong, you'll find yourself not only unpopular, but in some cases you may even be in trouble with the state. You may be in danger of losing your job, or even being arrested for a hate crime. Uh, coming back to Gavin Ashenden, uh, he commented on the dilemma. This is causing the Church of England in an article which he entitled, Meghan Markle, Justin Welby, and the Use and Abuse of Baptism. He writes of the fact that the state church has to offer baptism to anyone who asks of it, regardless of whether they have any intention to follow the baptismal promise of the prayer book. And he says, here is the dilemma for the, state, the Church of England. A state church wedded to a state that hates Christian virtue and Christian ethics 
a state that has begun to criminalize Christian witness as hate speech, where police arrest street preachers and have them thrown into prison at the push of a phone button, a state that has begun preparations to remove children from their Christian homes if social workers detect that they improperly label homophobia in the, what they improperly label homophobia in the parents, a state where Christian teachers are expelled and sacked if they do not endorse the secular brainwashing on the fluidity of gender. Faced with this kind of state, it does not require a subtle reading of scripture to observe that the gap between the world and the church has grown wide and fierce in our generation. And when this happens, Christians have to choose between the vigorous and sometimes brutal demands of allegiance the state imposes to cow and tame them, or the faithful witness to Jesus, which comes with an increasingly increasing and painful cost. So this has happened many times before. The last time we saw this gap between authentic and state Christianity in, Ge in Europe was in Germany in the 1930s. There, the fissure between the state-endorsed culture and the call of Jesus led to two church bodies. The state church, or Reich church, which smeared the religious veneer we have identified over the values and agenda of Nazism fixated with race, and the confessing church, led by Bonhoeffer, driven underground, reputing, repudiating the corrupt compromises of the state Reich Church. The Reich Church of our day has given way not over race, but over gender, not to a fascist culture, but to the new, new Marxist values and concepts peddled and enforced by universities, schools, state agencies, the police, and more recently, the judiciary. The neo-Marxist or cultural Marxist agenda sets itself not only against Judeo-Christian revelation and values, but goes further and sets itself against free speech. Petitions have been directed to Parliament to defend free speech in the face of the muzzle of the Equalities Act. I actually agree with it. Uh, that's the socio-political -prob problem we face. But let's get back to the Bible. 1 John 4, again. God is love. In 1 John 3, John says... Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know him because it does not, does not know us because it did not know him. In other words, the world does not know this love. Those who are born again through repentance and faith in Jesus come to know God who is love. The manifestation of God's love, according to 1 John, is revealed in the death of Jesus on the cross. Verse 10 of chapter 4 is very important. He says, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. If you understand that verse, you'll understand the very important thing about the cross and about the meaning of the death of Jesus and the meaning of God's love. The manifestation of God's love is shown actually in the death of Jesus on the cross. In the death of Jesus on the cross, he is the propitiation for our sins. So what does this mean? According to Bishop Curry's sermon, Jesus dying on the cross is an expression of his love for the world. Uh, it's an example for us to follow. If it's an example, how is it an example? Actually, if dying on the cross, having been through excruciating pain and suffering, is an example for love for us to follow, then it might be considered that he expects us to do the same which is pretty hard going and not exactly loving. John tells us that the propitiation, it was for the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation means to appease the anger of someone by making an offering which will satisfy that person who is angry with you. In the case of the cross, this means that Jesus takes the anger of God against sin on himself and offers pardon to the person who is facing punishment for what he has done by taking the punishment himself. And when we repent and believe, we receive that forgiveness and we receive the love of God. Until we do that, we're actually still under the wrath of God. According to the Bible, God is angry with sinners. Again, that sort of doesn't fit in with the God is love bit, but the Bible says it. Uh, when God looks down on the earth and he sees a world torn apart by violence, by children being abused, by people being enslaved, by drugs being pushed, pornography being pushed seeing occult manifestations in the media, on the internet, actually glorifying Satan and demons. Does that make him feel good about the place and his people? 
Does God say, uh, when he looks at the earth, aren't they lovely? How much I love them and accept them and respect their right to do these things? Actually, it says in the Bible, God is just God. God is a just judge. God is angry with the wicked every day. That's not the sort of thing you say at a wedding service, is it? But it's what the Bible says. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, following the verses which I just read about the gospel, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth is unrighteousness. It goes on to say, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, even their women exchanged the natural use for what is Against nature, likewise the men, leaving the natural use of women, burned in their lusts for, one, for other men, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, their whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Okay, so those are some of the things which actually make God angry. And says also, those who do those things are deserving of death, not only those who do the same, but also those who approve of those who practice them. Unfortunately, so much of the church is actually approving of people who practice those things. So they're actually placing themselves under the wrath of God. Now, Jesus died on the cross as the ultimate expression of his love, and there he bore the wrath of God on him against sin on himself so that we could be saved from it. Doing that, he fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 53, where it says, well, we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that by nature we're children of wrath, but God in his love sends Jesus into the world to redeem us from that condition, to make us into the children of God. And if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and turn to him, then we will turn from being under the wrath of God to being under the grace and the mercy of God. And that's the love of God. And it cost Jesus his life. It cost him that terrible suffering on the cross in order to redeem us, that we might become the children of God. Bishop Michael said he didn't sacrifice his life for himself or anything he would get out of it. He did it for others, for the other, for the good and well-being of others. That's love. Actually, he did get something out of it. What did he get out of it? He got us out of it. And that's why, it's, um, as far as God is concerned, that, he, that made it worth it for him. In Isaiah 53, a uh, great prophecy of the suffering servant Messiah, says in verse 10, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you see his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. That's saying that when Jesus rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and looks down now on the earth, he sees his seed, which is you and me, and he's satisfied. When he sees his seed, those who believed in him, and he's satisfied, that means he sees that it was worth it to go through all that pain on the cross in order that you and I might be redeemed. And he sees that as we are transformed from being children of wrath into children of God, it was worth making that incredible sacrifice that we might be saved through him. And in Hebrews it turns that uh, he did this in order to bring many sons to glory. And if we have believed in Jesus, we have been brought to glory through faith in him. But we have to believe in him. You can't just say that to a group of unbelievers and say that they're saved, because they're not. Uh, John chapter 1 tells us very clearly that as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God, who were born not of the flesh, nor of the blood, nor of the will of man, but of God. But you have to receive him in order to be a child of God. You're not a child of God by nature. And this uh, comes on to the point where it says that uh, 
Jesus founded the revolutionary movement, a movement that's built on the unconditional love of God for the world and gave us a mandate to live that love. Now, it's not actually unconditional. Um, one sense, you could say, yes, God does love the world in principle. He loves the people in the world. But whether or not we benefit from the love of God is actually conditional. It's conditional on us accepting him. If we don't accept him, then actually we don't receive anything from the cross. In fact, we receive judgment from the cross. That comes out even in the most famous passage in the Bible in John chapter 3, where it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So actually there are two possibilities, one that you perish, the other that you have eternal life. Goes on to say, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. He who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. The passage says very clearly there are two ways you can go in response to the cross. You can believe and accept it or you can reject and go away from it. If you believe and accept, you come to the light and you walk in the light. If you reject, you remain in the darkness and you go further into the darkness. And in the end it says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. In fact, at the end, if you remain in unbelief, you'll face the eternal separation between God and with God. You won't be accepted. You'll face an eternity in hell separated from God. That's not very inclusive, of, and you might say it's not very loving, but it's what the scriptures teach. There's a choice everyone has to make. And Bishop Curry's message and the message of much of the professing church today is actually not giving people the, the option to make that choice. Message is what is preached very much in a lot of the liberal Protestant church and increasingly in some of the evangelical church as well. Anybody here read a book called The Shack? No, The Shack is a very popular book today. It's one of the bestsellers on the uh, New York uh, bestseller list. Shack is a book which uh, actually preaches universalism. Everyone gets reconciled to God in the end. God doesn't condemn or judge anybody. Uh, in the uh, book, The Shack, the person who's supposed to be God speaking, he says, I'm not who you think I am. I don't punish sin. Mercy triumphs over justice because of love. I'm now fully reconciled to the world. Yes, in Jesus, you're not under any law. All things are lawful. In Jesus, I've forgiven all humans for their sins against me. Is that true? Jesus, he hasn't forgiven all humans because humans have to make the the choice themselves to repent and believe. And in the end, it ends up with a doctrine of universalism, which means that God accepts everybody into heaven in the end. And if I would interpret Bishop Curry's message at the, sermon, at the sermon, that's precisely what he was saying. One implication is that if, if God accepts everyone, no matter what they believe, no matter how they behave, we should also... We should also believe, therefore, that all religions lead to God. So we shouldn't preach the gospel to people of other faiths because we're all accepted as we are. We shouldn't say there's anything wrong with Islam, for example, or Hinduism, uh, or even Judaism, uh, because those are the religions which people are born into and they should keep those religions and uh, be accepted by God because of them. We shouldn't say that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And there's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. If that's the case, then that means that you can't be saved by being a good Muslim or a good Hindu. You have to be saved by being a good Christian. Uh, and a Christian in the true sense of repenting and believing the gospel in Jesus. Also means that God doesn't accept all lifestyles, including sexual promiscuity, adultery, homosexual practice, uh, and marriage, and transsexualism. Maybe that we've been into those things. Maybe that some of us have all sinned in that area. We can repent and believe the gospel, but we can't continue in them. If we continue in them, then we're actually going against the gospel. And one of the problems is that if you say there's something wrong with these things today, you're being judgmental, and you may be judged 
yourself as being in the wrong by the New World Order state, especially you do so in the name of Jesus the Messiah. The Bible says there is a judgment. It's appointed to man to die and after death the judgment. Therefore God commands all people everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. The sinner who doesn't repent is not reconciled to God and actually faces eternal judgment. It's a message which people don't want to hear today, but it is actually what the Bible says, and we have to recognize it. And we must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, who died for our sins once and for all, and rose again for our justification, and opens the way into the kingdom of God for us. Just as he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we do come to the Father through Jesus the Messiah. Finally, what about the power of love to change the world? Uh, he says, uh, imagine our families where this way of love is the way. Uh, no child would go to bed hungry in such a world as that. Poverty would become history. The earth would be a sanctuary. We'd all treat each other as children of God, regardless of differences. There'd be a new heaven, a new earth, a new and beautiful human family, the very dream of God. The way of Jesus is to love the world. It's a game changer. But all you need is love. Love is all you need. The problem is it doesn't work. Anyone who tries it will soon find it doesn't work and will end up disappointed and disillusioned. Human beings actually have free will, free will to choose good or evil. No matter how much you love some people, no matter how much you tell them about Jesus and tell them that Jesus loves them, they'll continue to choose evil. 1 John chapter 5, verse 9 tells us something which... Uh, is missed out in this uh, view of the world which Bishop Curry was giving. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world is in the power of the grip of evil. Do you believe that? Uh, Satan's actually been rather voted out of existence in this new theology, that he doesn't show up at all hardly. But even if we vote him out of existence, he's still there. And he's going about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he is the God of this world. Uh, he is the God who is the false God. But he is God who's carrying on his business today, tempting people to sin. Using all kinds of influences to fuel human wickedness, whether it's entertainment, the internet, antichrist religions like Islam, which actually fuel violence and hatred. Practices like yoga, which bring about a spiritual deception and counterfeit religious experiences. Drugs, gangs, pornography, sexual immorality. All those things come from the evil one, who is the God of this world. Uh, Jesus said in the days before his return, because wickedness is increased, most, lo most men's love will grow cold. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us something about the condition of life in the last days. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, Know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, tra traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. From such people, turn away. Not an optimistic view, actually, of how the world's going to go at the end of days. There's one way out of this, that's to repent and believe in the gospel, which will result in new birth. Jesus said there's a narrow road which leads to life, and there's a broad road which leads to destruction. Get on the narrow road. The minority who find it are saved from the wrath to come. But in many ways, I see the present world system like a sinking ship. It's got so many holes in it that uh, no matter how hard we try, we're not going to save it. What we can do is get on the lifeboat, which is salvation through faith in Jesus, and tell other people to get on the lifeboat through faith in Jesus the Messiah. It doesn't mean to say we shouldn't do what we can to make the world a better place and work for good of, of humanity, but it does mean that if we think that by showing love and care for people we're going to save the world, we're going to end up disillusioned. Uh, The prophetic vision of a world without poverty, war and corruption will come to pass, but it will only come to pass after the Lord Jesus returns himself in power and glory. 
And after, when he comes to, part, to return himself, he's going to judge the world in righteousness. In the meantime, Revelation says, the very last chapter of the Bible, um, I can find the verse. Yeah, verse 10, it says, Do not seal the, the words of prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. Who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Until the second coming of Christ, there'll be basically two groups of people who God will see on the earth, those who are justified by faith in Jesus and those who are unjustified. Those who are unjustified will continue to sin. And as I say, no matter how much you love them, unless they themselves repent and believe the gospel of their own free will, they will not change their nature from being children of wrath to being children of God. It may sound pessimistic, but the hope is that we can, each one of us can experience that life-giving change through faith in Jesus. And through faith in Jesus, we will be born again. And God does want us to love people. <laughs> I hope you don't think I'm saying that we shouldn't love, but I'm saying that there is a limitation on the application of what he was saying there, which we have to understand. God is love, and if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will give us the ability to love God and to love our neighbor as ourself, and that's what he wants. He tells us to love one another. Uh, this is the sign of uh, our faith that we actually love one another. It should be uh, our expression of, of our being. Uh, Paul tells us we're to put on love, the bond of perfection, in Colossians chapter 3. That's the high standard which God wants us to live. And as we put on that love which comes from Jesus Christ, he'll give us the ability to love others and to love one another. But it's only in Jesus. And some people think that that's dogmatic, it's unfair, because there are nice people out there in the world who are not Christians. I'm not saying that that's not the case. Uh, but the fact is that the love of God can only be experienced in Jesus the Messiah. And if you tell a group of people who are not saved that they're all children of God, you're actually telling them something which is untrue. If you tell them they're all experiencing the love of God uh, and they haven't turned to faith, repentance and faith to Jesus, you're not telling them the truth. The truth is that if we have not repented and believed the gospel and been born again, we're actually, the Bible says, children of wrath and under the judgment of God. There's a way to escape that. That's through faith in Jesus. There's only one way through faith in Jesus. Because Jesus' love was shown not just by a sentimental feeling of let's be nice to each other, it was shown by an action of going to the cross to take the punishment for the sin of the world so that he would be the propitiation for our sins, the one who bore the wrath of God against sin in himself so that we could be saved and set free from it. Now I appreciate that Bishop Michael had six minutes, I think, to speak and he wouldn't have been able to get all that across and it's probably not the thing which you would say in a wedding service. But if I analyse his message, which is what he says elsewhere, and what much of the church is saying elsewhere, it's actually missing out that whole element which I've talked about today, which is God is a God of love, but he's also a God who judges sin, and a God who says that we need to repent personally and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to receive his love. So let's be those who do enter into the love of God, but let's know that we can only receive it as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the price for our sins at the cross, demonstrating his love for us. And in that love, we can be born again to eternal life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the love of God which was revealed to us in our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. We thank you that you, the Holy One, are willing to take on flesh, to lay down your life as a sacrifice for the sin of the world, to pay the price for our sins to be the one who would receive the, in yourself the wrath of God against sin in order that we might be forgiven and cleansed and pardoned and delivered from the wrath to come that we might be those who have a glorious future and a hope as we believe on the Lord Jesus the Messiah. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe. May each one of us believe in our hearts and know the reality of sin forgiven, of Christ in you, the hope of glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.